of reasons. Number one, and uh, we're looking forward to listening to uh, uh, David Mahler, who is the head of school for uh, both uh, the Lakewood Ranch and uh, across the street. And he's going to be sharing with us the, the, uh, the history of the Out of Door Academy and its relationship with uh, Siesta Key Chapel. Um, some of you may not know that and know the importance that uh, the Out of Door Academy had in, in the uh, founding, really, of Siesta Key Chapel. They were instrumental in providing a place to worship and then very instrumental in providing a place where we could build uh, our, our, our church. And so uh, we're looking forward to hearing from uh, David Muller. Um, also, after this, uh, after this meeting, another important event in the life of this church is that uh, we'll, I'm gonna dis we'll go out and you'll have a chance to say hello to David Muller and thank you for that and hit, grab a cup of coffee, but then, then you need to come back in. Uh, because we're going to have a congregational meeting uh, to elect the pastoral nominating committee, uh, which will uh, be charged with uh, searching for the next called installed pastor for uh, Siesta Key Chapel. And so we'll, we'll need, uh, you know, a, a minimum of 23 pe or 26 people here. But I really hope that everybody who's a member uh, will come back in. It will probably take about 10 or 15 minutes uh, to uh, act upon that that slate of candidates. But it's also it's a, it's, a, it's a crossroads point uh, right now in my uh, relationship with you because we've gone through our congregational study and now we're at that point where we are going to be electing the pastoral nominating committee, which will uh, write a mission information form uh, describing our church and, and what we are looking for in, in a pastor. And then they're going to uh, publish that uh, through uh, the Presbyterian Church USA and they will then get about a tsunami of, uh, I can guarantee, of applications for this position. And then they're going to have to weed through those. Well, the All Church Nominating Committee has done a phenomenal job recruiting the folks that uh, are on the Pastoral Nominating Committee. And uh, uh, they did it dil with diligence, but also what's most important, they did it with prayer. <laughs> you know, we, we prayed at certain points through that whole those meetings as we were looking for folks to uh, uh, serve on the pastoral nominating committee, they, 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 they prayed on just about on every, I think on every one in, on, that, on that list. And so um, I, I'm really excited about this day because this is an important time as an interim minister to say, okay, we've gotten to this point. This is a major milestone in this, in this transitional time, okay? Um, other things that uh, you might want to uh, need to be reminded of, and there's a wrong time for Howard Kaler's memorial service in the, in the bulletin. It's at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, so, and that will be on Saturday, this coming Saturday, 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and uh, with a uh, reception uh, following at... Bob, where do you live? <laughs> Esplanade by the sea. What? Esplanade by the Sea. That's where the reception by Siesta Key. Esplanade by Siesta Key, and uh, the, there will be information on how to get into the the, the reception in the memorial bulletins. So, uh, also just want to uh, remind you that uh, today's a good day to check your blood pressures. And uh, will you be out there, Carol, checking blood pressures? Hmm? Yeah, and. Uh, no, it's good to check on your blood pressures. And if we have children in worship, we always have these worship bags now for children at this time of year for them to uh, uh, keep busy uh, during the worship service. Are there any visitors who would like to introduce themselves? Does anybody have a guest they'd like to introduce? Well, sign the fellowship pad. You'll find it in each pew. Pass it to your neighbor. Take that opportunity to learn each other's name. But before you do that, oh, it's not pew. I say pew. That's, that's 40 years of, of, of ministry. Row. There's a there's a there's a pad in the, in in your row that looks like this. Sign that, and uh, especially if you're a visitor, we'd like to have your email address so we can include you uh, on our. Hey, how about the how about the Friday e blast? Did you like that, folks who got it? Okay, those folks who if we don't have your email address, you're missing out on something because we just started uh, sending out weekly mailings uh, just as reminders of what's going on in the church. Uh, in the week, in the coming weeks, so uh, uh, through a program called Mailchimp. So, give us your uh, email address, and we'll we'll be sure you're getting uh, getting that. So, let's all stand up and say a uh, grand good morning to each other.
Okay, friends, let's prepare our hearts and our minds for worship. I don't mean this literally, but this is the psalm according to the message. On your feet, now, applaud God, bring a gift of laughter, sing yourselves into his presence. He made us. He didn't make, we didn't make him. We're his people, his well-tended sheep. Enter with the password, thank you. Make yourselves at home, talking praise, thank him, worship him. Let us worship our Lord with song and word. You may be seated. In our bulletin is a prayer of confession, and as Presbyterians, we, we see, say this unison prayer of confession, and folks say, well, why do I have to say that unison prayer of confession, Tom? I'm much better than I am, than that confession indicates. And, well, that might be true. Maybe you are. But what we also say as Presbyterians is that we support one another in our lives, in our fallenness. And so we say this printed prayer together supporting one another and follow it with our own silent and personal confessions. So let's say this prayer that's printed in the bulletin. Our Father, we are so tired of pretending. Forgive us for the times we have succeeded in deceiving our friends 
and loved ones, for we know that we did not deceive you. In sinning against others, we know that we have sinned against you in the same way. We know that in our ignorance, we have cast a shadow upon many. We have stood in the way of their discovery of your way and your presence. O oh God, forgive us, receive us, and make us ever true in Jesus' name. Amen. Put away from you all bitterness and wrath and anger and wrangling and slander, together with all malice, and be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ has forgiven you. Now that in Christ you are forgiven, live in love as Christ loved you. Amen.
I'd like to invite the children to come forward, please. JJ, I know you're out there. So rather than my children, I'm going to call you. I'd like to invite my buddy to come forward, okay? <laughs> How are you doing? Good. Well, I think I know, I'm know. i going to know the answer when I get this from you, but uh, do you like going to school? Yeah. Hmm? Yes. Yeah? Yes? Oh, geez, you, you fooled me. Well, I want to show you something. Come on over here. Um, you know why I wear this gown? You ever know why? And, well, some people say it's because I'm a teacher, but really these gowns originate with students. Uh, back in the old, old days, students used to wear gowns, and they, they uh, cloaked themselves, so it took away uh, uh, any kind of recognition of who they were, and so they understood that they were just going to be students. Now, there's a word uh, in the Bible that means students. Do you, do you, have you ever heard that word before? Yeah. I bet you have. It's the word disciples. Have you ever heard that word before? Yes. yes. Okay. Well, disciples means students. Um, in fact, when I took Latin in high school, uh, every audio tape in my Latin class started off "Salute de Scipuli," and that meant "Hello, students." And uh, uh, so, when Jesus called his apostles disciples, what he was really calling them was students, which meant that Jesus was their teacher. So what I want to uh, talk with you about today is how important it is to learn and keep learning in your life. Um, some people say that if you stop learning in your life, it's like a tree that stops growing, it's dead. And we always should be learning. And um, in fact, I wanted to give you an, an example of what, what uh, I'm doing right now to learn. So. Uh, right now, I'm taking my instrument flight rating, uh, and this, I have to learn all of this stuff in order to pass my instrument flight rating. And it's really interesting stuff. And you can see there's colored maps and all sorts of different stuff in here. But it's important for me to always keep learning. There's something on my gown that also tells me that I tells you that I've kept learning because I got three stripes on my gown, which means I have my doctorate degree, which is a, uh, in the ministry about the highest degree you can get. Um, so um, today we have um, uh, Mr. Mollard coming here from the Out of Door Academy, and the Out of Door Academy is just across the street. You probably know that, don't you? And um, uh, he is in charge of a lot of disciples, a lot of students, just like the principal of your school is in charge of a lot of students. And uh, it's important for you to know, JJ, that, that uh, God wants you to continue to be a learner, to always be a learner um, all your life, not just when you get done with high school or not just when you get done with college or wherever it is you might go in your life or, or career or, or vocation you might choose, that God is always calling us to be learners. God is always calling us to be disciples, and more importantly, always to be disciples, students of Jesus. Okay? You with me on that? Okay. Okay. Let's say a prayer. Dear God, Dear God we thank you for Jesus, and we thank you for disciples, and we pray that you make each of us into disciples. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for coming up here. You're a brave guy. This morning's scripture lesson comes to us, really one of my favorite scripture lessons, because it, it, it contains in it the Shema, which is uh, um, uh, hero, uh, hero Israel, the Lord your God is one. And that's, a, that's an important statement. Um, it's an important statement not only for us as Christians, but it's an important statement in, in the Jewish faith as well. And this is from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 1 through 9. These are the commands, decrees, and the laws of the Lord your God that directed me that the Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess. 
and so that your, you, your children, and their children after them may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all his decrees and commands that I give you and so that you may enjoy long life. Now, when the Old Testament talks about fearing the Lord like that, it doesn't mean that you should be scared of the Lord. What, it's, what it means is that you should respect the Lord, you should respect the laws, you continue to develop that respect as a student. And I always have been struck by this scripture in that it tells us that we are continually to teach our children these important things. And I think that's an important thing for us to understand today as a church, Siesta Key Chapel, but also as individuals, as, as grandparents, as parents, that we're called to instruct that the best teachers for any child are the teachers that lead the household that they live in. And so that's important in this passage. And then it goes on to say, Hear Israel, and be careful to obey so that it may go well with you and that you may increase greatly in the land flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord, uh, the God of your ancestors, promised you. And so the Israelites are there at the River Jordan. They're about to cross over into Canaan. These are the rules that Moses is giving them. Moses can't follow them, but he, he says this is the important stuff. And he says, and the most important stuff is this, and it's in the next, pa next uh, paragraph. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. Well, this is what we're supposed to be teaching our children. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. And we also know that Jesus added something else onto that, and he said, and then you shall love your neighbor as yourself. When he was asked, what is the greatest of all commandments? And then Deuteronomy goes on to say, these commandments I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your homes and on your gates. Well, this is the word of the Lord. When I arrived at Siesta Key Chapel, uh, there were no children in worship, uh, very few children, uh, as there are today, and, and I, I raised that question. And I've got to tell you that uh, I can't tell you the number of times folks said, well, there are no children on Siesta Key. <laughs> and, um, uh, and I looked across the street and I thought, well, there's the Out of Door Academy right across the street <laughs> with kindergarten through fifth grade. Pre-K pre, pre through, through, through uh, uh, fifth grade. And um, then we got active in our congregational study, and one of the angles of our congregational study was to uh, do a demographic study of the area. And what we discovered in that demographic study is that the three fastest growing demographics within about a five mile radius, radius of Siesta Key are, of course, you would guess, retired folks, uh, like many of us. But then the next fastest growing uh, demographic were people from 35 to 45 years old. And the next one after that were school-age children. Well, this told us in the, in the Congregational Study Committee that, that well, um, maybe that, that, that statement that there are no children on Siesta Key is something that we need to test. And so uh, Tim Gannon and I went over and we talked to uh, the Out of Door Academy. Uh, we got a chance to meet with David Mahler. And uh, I asked David, uh, where do your children come from? And he said about 80% of them come within five miles. 80% um, uh, of the children at the Out of Door Academy come within five miles. Uh, sure, they might be crossing a bridge to get here, but um, Again, this was a confirmation to us that, yes, there are children on Siesta Key. And uh, it's an important thing for us to pay attention to, I think, as we move into the future uh, as Siesta Key Chapel. 
And this is part of my job as an interim minister to kind of peel away the onion and to, uh, to see what's, what's really at the core and possibility for the ministries of this church. And so when I was talking with David, I, I uh, invited him to come to uh, one of our worship services to, to talk about the Out of Door Academy. And many of you know we were going to do that on March 28th, but he had, he had some family uh, uh, issues that uh, caused him to go out to California. A dear friend of his passed away, and he wanted to go to his memorial service, and so we rescheduled it for today. Uh, David continues to be through some uh, more difficult times. For uh, yesterday, you did a memorial service for your father, right, uh, out at uh, Bay Village, and so uh, it's it's my privilege to uh, welcome him uh, to be our speaker this morning and to talk to us about the relationship between the Out of Door Academy and Siesta Key Chapel. Um, it's an interest. We only. We're coming up on our 50th anniversary as a, as a congregation. The first worship service was in 1970. And uh, it's, it's interesting to note that the first worship services took place on the campus of the Out of Door Academy. And um, that when it came to a time for searching for property, there, uh, Bernice Weiss will tell you this story, there was a move to have uh, uh, the church uh, settled at, uh, at a particular piece of uh, land and and uh, the neighbors weren't too happy about it. And when the congregation found themselves in kind of a pickle, the owner at that time of the Out of Door Academy offered to sell this piece of property. And so I'm going to let David tell us that story uh, and, I'm, uh, and to make that connection and to talk to us about the history of this very interesting and fascinating school. Uh, David's been uh, serving at the Out of Door Academy as the head of school since 2004 and uh, has made uh, some really huge accomplishments. Uh, he has spent most of his life uh, as a, uh, in independent education, uh, serving as a teacher and a coach and then as an administrator, um, both in boarding school and day school settings. So in his tenure at the Out of Door Academy, he has led the school through uh, some great development and redevelopment. And I hope you tell the story about why you were called here originally, David, which was to close the Siesta Key Chapel, or uh, the Siesta Key Campus, and, and how they found out that that was not going to be a viable uh, option. Uh, he has been a, a, an incredible success in development and redevelopment of uh, uh, the Siesta Key cha uh, Campus and uh, has a phenomenal success in building the endowment fund for the Out of Door Academy. Um, so it's my privilege to uh, welcome uh, to our, our pulpit this morning, uh, Mr. David Mahler. David? Do you mind if I go out front? No. Oh, is that okay? This, this picking up? Can you hear me? Okay, great. Well, good morning. Um, I grew up in a Presbyterian church, so this is very familiar to me and feels kind of like a second home. Uh, we do all of our fifth grade graduations here. We do some other special events here. Um, and uh, we, we love our relationship uh, with this congregation. And uh, I, will, I will try to illuminate a little bit of the history between the two organizations. Um, there's, I will say that when this transfer took place, it was early in the 1970s, um, which was an interesting time in our country. And uh, let's just say that the records from that time at the Outdoor Academy are not stellar. Uh, but I, I will piece that together as I give you a little bit of history. And uh, JJ, if you ever don't love school, you come see me, okay? You come across the street and we'll have a conversation and uh, we'll see if we could do something about that. I'm glad you love school because every kid should love school. So I'm going to give you a little bit of a, just a snapshot of who we are as, as an organization. And then I'm going to show you hopefully some really great old pictures. My wife Elizabeth is our archivist, and so she's the historian. So if you're ever interested in seeing more uh, pictures or items or artifacts from all the way back to 1924. So uh, this upcoming year for us will be our 95th anniversary and a big celebration. And, and perhaps we can partner with the Siesta Key Chapel to do some of those events right here. So this is our mission. We're a college prep school. 100% of our kids go on to four-year colleges and universities across the country. Um, our focus is academics, arts, athletics, and character. And what I always say to new parents when they come into the school is what, what's the point in s sending smart, evil kids out into the world? So we take 
the, this notion of character development very seriously, and we believe that the moral and ethical development of children is equally as important as their academic um, development. And I'll talk a little bit more about the founder's original vision a little bit later on. These are our core values. This drives everything that we do on a daily basis. These are the things that we believe are walking the walk of trying to raise kids with moral integrity and strong character. So here's where the story begins. These two glamorous women, uh, that's Miss Gavin and Miss Harrison, and that's a picture right here from Siesta Key. And uh, they were nurses during World War I. And they actually, after World War I, they toured around Europe and they studied what they thought were the most progressive uh, schools and educational practices in the world at that particular time. So the school was founded in 1924 in the heart of the progressive era in American history. And this school was actually known nationally as one of the most progressive schools in the United States during that period of time. The guy in the middle, his name is Harrison Raoul. He'll become uh, the third headmaster of the school. Um, he was related to Miss Harrison. But I love the fact that, uh, number one, it documents the history between their outfits and that beautiful automobile. But two, that these you know, founders and visionary women are just you know, gobbling up some watermelon on the side of a dirt road here on Siesta Key, and that's kind of what the place looked like way back then. This is a uh, glamour shot from, this is an early brochure of the school. Uh, and uh, back then, um, we had Gulf Front property, and you'll learn a little bit more about that later on. Um, but this was to send out across the United States, hey, if you really want to love school, you might spend part of your day on a sailboat, and that'd be a pretty good way um, to be entertained. This is 1926. Uh, that is what the sign at Out of Door, and you'll notice that it says Out of Door School. So for the first, really until the time that the school transferred the land and sold off the lands for this chapel to be developed, it was always the Out of Door School. At the time, in 1976-77, the school became a not-for-profit. It changed its name from the Out of Door School to the Out of Door Academy. Um, so that's, so we actually have our, our oldest alums are from the out of door school and they don't like it. They don't even like the word academy. They wish that it was still just the out of door school. So that's where that history comes from. This is, this is the property. So uh, Siesta Key looks just a little bit different uh, today than it does back in this area. And I don't know if I've got a pointer on this or not, but if you see that little rectangle um, on the water, those are the original swim docks from the out-of-door school. So the original property that the out-of-door school had, and it was Miss Harrison's father who kind of gifted that so that they could create this, this school together, um, that's the original, it was just about 41, 42 acres of land, including the land where we uh, sit today. Um, the, this is our transportation infrastructure. Um, and that long bus went all the way to the state of Maine if you can imagine that. And it went all the way to the state of Maine before I-95 existed. So uh, the school was actually originally a boarding school. And for those of you that ever park over uh, there when you have a crowded Sunday, those buildings were army barracks that were donated to the school and those became the original dormitories. And so these two women, their, their vision for this school, which attracted kids literally from kind of all over the country, they believe this. They believe that fresh air, physical activity and the arts would lead to a higher level of academic achievement and wellness. Because they were nurses, they really believed in the health and well-being of all the students that came here. Now what we know today from a brain scan is that exercise, arts, physical activity, all those things stimulate uh, the brain. And we do believe that the more uh, time that kids spend out of doors, the happier they are and the healthier they are. So the kids over there and the kids at Lakewood Ranch, generally, almost every day, they eat outside. Their physical activity is outside. All that is grounded in sort of our original founder's uh, vision for the health and well-being of children. Uh, that's what the glorious uh, you know, uh, dormitories look like back in the day on Siesta Key. You notice that that wasn't in the brochure with the sailing uh, on there. So we were, we were good marketers even in the old days. Um, this is what a dorm room looked like. No air conditioning, just open, open air. So when it was cold, you put the shutters down, and when it was hot, you pulled them up. And that's about all the uh, thermostat control that you had in those days. 
This is an amazing picture. Actually, it was an alum that gave this to us uh, recently. So that's looking back. That, that structure was the original dining hall at the out-of-door school. So as you know, it's hard to find a great place to eat on the water in, in uh, Sarasota. All the condos and all the hotels, and they gobbled up all that waterfront property. Well, way back when, the best place to eat on the water in Sarasota, unequivocally, was in the dining hall um, right here, right across the street here was where that dining hall existed. Um, this is a little bit of a, a darker picture. It's hard to see. Um, but when Miss Gavin passed away in, in the early 1930s, uh, the faculty and the students built uh, kind of the symbol of our school. It was the original library. It sits in the middle of our campus, and it was constructed during their free period. So these are students literally handing the shingles up to a faculty member who's uh, nailing the shingles on the top of the original library. Um, that's uh, a picture of the library on the outside. And this is the out-of-door model for education at work back from the 1920s. Sitting in small groups, Socratic seminar, almost all the classes literally were held outside, out of doors, hence the name, because it was cooler out of doors than it was indoors, um, with no air conditioning back then. This is what it looks like inside uh, the library. Even those hinges were fabricated by the students. Um, so back in that time, there was a lot of hands-on learning, uh, a lot of things that they were learning how to do. There was carpentry and and uh, metallurgy and things like that as part of the curriculum. Uh, this guy is a very famous guy. Um, if you've ever been to the Edison estate, that is Mr. Edison. Mr. Edison was very close with our founders. And so Mr. Edison actually used to celebrate his birthday on Siesta Key, or out of door students used to go down to Fort Myers and celebrate with him. And the tradition that we have after we do graduation for our fifth graders, they leave a tile behind. They're, they're able to create a stone that they leave on the campus and they can come back and visit forever and ever and ever. That tradition comes from Thomas Edison. Because if you've been to the Edison estate, you see Goodyear, you see Firestone, you see all the great kind of barons of that era. When they came to Edison, they fabricated a stone and left it behind as a memory of their visit. Um, this woman is less famous, but very important. Jane Adams is her name. She's one of the greatest uh, social reformers in the, era, the progressive era, um, did amazing things in terms of addressing poverty and a variety of other uh, social issues. And that picture is taken actually right outside that, uh, the library that I just showed you. So literally, the school was drawing visitors and, and very important people. Eleanor Roosevelt visited the school twice um, uh, during visits to uh, this part of the Gulf Coast. This is the way days started on Siesta Key many moons ago with the Pledge of Allegiance. Um, this is a picture from National Geographic. So the school was, was very well known and they actually did a feature um, um, and this documents kind of these outdoor classrooms and the fact that maps were painted on the outside of buildings and everything else because kids were spending all that time outside. Uh, this is what a schoolroom looked like back in the old days. And I, I never show this slide without pointing out this young woman here in the front. You see that scowl? Yeah, and so I always wonder, like what did that boy do to her that she is so distraught? And then for all the males, in the, this, is the, this is the life that we live, right? We can, uh, the women are smarter. I gotta believe that, that uh, um, if you look closely at the picture, she's completed her puzzle and he hasn't even started yet. And my guess is that as much as they were progressive and believed in differentiating the instruction, she probably couldn't do anything else until he finished. She was not real happy about that. That's the, my best thinking about that slide. Uh, so we move on. Arts, a big part of the education still are today. Uh, we had our arts day yesterday as well as my dad's service. So unfortunately, we couldn't bring uh, any of our musicians here today. But uh, they do perform in this space quite often. This was recess. So every day after lunch, plunge into the Gulf of Mexico and uh, burn off a little steam and get a little bit cooler. Um, I will say this publicly. Uh, I don't have the photographs uh, to, to uh, document this, um, but it is, it is rumored that in the old days, uh, swimsuits were optional. So I, I say that thinking about kids growing up in this era and kind of the gotcha era of cell phones and everything else. Imagine kind of going to the beach and your teachers being like, well, if you want to wear a bathing suit, you can. But if you don't, just kind of plunge into the water. Uh, we live in a very different world today. 
equestrian. We had stables on campus, and so the horses would go up and down all the kind of trails and the beaches on Siesta Key. That's a big part of, this was nap time. Uh, so before we had any understanding of sunscreen and UV rays and issues like that, but we were living the out door brand every step of the way. Uh, so that is nap time, and you can see right through there um, the Gulf of Mexico. So again, the, the campus kind of sprawled around, and this area was actually kind of an open play area for the kids. So the horses would come through here, the kids could come through here. Uh, it wasn't dedicated to any buildings or spaces. Uh, it was part of the adjacent uh, campus. 1995, things changed. Big group of parents said we don't want, the, the school almost exclusively was pre-K-8. And they said, we don't want to send our kids to boarding school or uh, send them to a public school in Sarasota. So the idea was to open up uh, a new campus, which is the beginning of the Lakewood Ranch campus. And you can see that's 17 miles. Uh, but as I know, commuting it quite a bit, uh, I wish it took 17 minutes. Um, in, in season, it could take me an hour and 17 minutes to get between there and here. But you also see the scale. Um, so in 1976, at the time that the chapel uh, received its kind of plot of land, um, it was David Band, actually, a very uh, prominent attorney in town, who negotiated a deal. And the out-of-door school became the out-of-door academy. And the parents collected $200,000. So for the five acres and the existing structures in 1976, that deal was struck. Um, prior to that, it was a proprietary school. It was owned by families. And it was the rich family, no pun intended, uh, that actually liquidated the campus. And they sold the parcel, ultimately, to the Siesta Key uh, Chapel so the congregation could start here. Um, and we don't know exactly how many years that those services were held, but I know on the, on the cover of the program today, you can see what was called our multi-purpose room, which was a public theater. So uh, theater performances happened there, uh, sort of like um, well, not quite the Van Wazel exactly, uh, but on a much smaller scale in one of the original buildings. But local theater groups used to perform in there, and uh, it was just negotiated. There was no rental fee or anything like that. The chapel was interested in holding services and beginning their congregation. And then when the land became available, uh, this parcel uh, was, was uh, part of that land transfer. So in Lakewood Ranch, we actually have 90 acres now. We just picked up another five acres. Um, the family that behind SMR is the Eline family. The Eline family, uh, all their kids went to out of door. They gifted us the 90 acres. So we have 90 acres right across the street from the country club um, of Lakewood Ranch. Uh, this is what the campus looks like out there. That's the groundbreaking in 1996. And actually for several years, our oldest students went to school here. So we ran out of space across the street. And so the original graduating class, which graduated in 1999, the first high school class that we graduated, was 12 students. But those 12 students did their eighth and ninth grade year here on this property because there was no room over there. So again, this relationship has gone uh, on, and, and uh, you have been tremendously gracious and, and wonderful partners and neighbors for us for a long time. Um, that's the beginning of construction at Lakewood Ranch. And if you know that area, uh, across the street is the beginning of the polo grounds. It looks a little bit different out there today. This is right near where the big new water side development and all that is happening in Lakewood Ranch. Um, whoops, that's going back one. That's the original campus. And then this is our most recent building, a new uh, field house to support our athletic program. And I'm glad to see that um, Elton and Gordy White, where are you guys? Yeah, they came in back over here. They are proud grandparents at Out of Door and very supportive of the school, and they were um, one of the families that helped us make this dream come true for uh, the young people at Out of Door. So, give you a little bit of a kind of a snapshot um, of just the overall school. You can see the 95 acres on two campuses. Um, everyone thinks of us as a really small school, uh, which we are, I guess, in comparison with public schools, but we have 135 people that work full time for us. Um, you can see that we're close to 20 million. Actually, next year we'll have a $20 million operating budget. Our endowment is actually now pushed up closer to 25 million. Um, so that supports and uh, offsets our offer operating budget in a pretty dramatic way. Um, an important story that isn't often told is how many students come on financial assistance. 
So uh, over 25% of the student body uh, gets support from the school. And we give well over $2 million in financial assistance, very similar to what colleges and universities do. We don't give any merit scholarships. The only scholarships we give are for families that um, do qualify. Annual giving, like fundraising, uh, the donations I know that support this institution, we have to raise $1.2 million every year just to make the budget work. So now you know beyond the kids why my hair is gray. When I took this job, it was all black. My mother says I can do something about that. I haven't quite been able to wrap my head around that. Um, and there's college matriculation, 99.9%. 70% of our kids go outside of the state of Florida, despite a lot of great schools here. Um, the 0.1% the is a young man named Desmond Lindsay, uh, who is a fantastic uh, student athlete and was drafted by the New York Mets a couple years ago in the second round. Um, so he chose a $1.5 million signing bonus over a four-year scholarship at the University of North Carolina. The headmaster was not happy with that decision, uh, but it was a good decision uh, for Desmond and his family. And then enrollment, just so you have a picture, we have 750 students, actually grown a little bit, will be larger than that next year. Right across the street here, we have 250, and then bigger, we're, uh, we're embarking this summer on an expansion of our middle school, so we'll actually be growing out the middle school closer to the the 300 number in the upper school. And then the demographics. 17% uh, of our students are students of color. Um, almost 10, used to be 10% uh, of our students were international. We know the kind of demographics of Sarasota and people coming from all over, all over the world to be here. Many of them come here with education being their top priority with children. And uh, we find them matriculating too out of door. And this past year, we had 145 new students they came from 12 states around the country, uh, around the U.S., and then five countries. Um, and generally, we have about a 50-50 split every year. 50% of our incoming students come from the Sarasota area, but 50% come from other parts of the country. Many of them coming from other independent schools or prep schools um, in uh, New England, kind of the Midwest. California and Colorado tend to be our biggest kind of feeders into the school. So uh, that gives you, you know, at least a little bit of a snapshot. I was told to be on 17 minutes. I forgot to hit my watch at the beginning of it. Um, but I'm glad you weren't counting, because maybe if I did that at the beginning or mentioned the 17-minute rule, then, then uh, you tell me if I'm on or off uh, at this point in time. But if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer anything um, that might be on your minds. Um, I hope I haven't bored you. I'm very passionate about the school. I'm very passionate about education. Um, so this is, this is my life's calling, this is, this is what I do. Yes, ma'am. Great question. So this, this year's class is the largest class uh, ever to graduate. So we went from 12 in 1999. This year's graduating class, um, knock on wood, I just said this to the parents the other day at the luncheon, is 81. Our target is 80, that's our maximum. Uh, this year's class is 81, and the reason I knock is I'm hoping I don't have to expel anyone uh, between now and <laughs> commencement. So our, <laughs> our seniors have just finished uh, their academics. They'll take their AP exams in the next two weeks. Then they go out into the community and serve in internships and then come back uh, to us for commencement on June 1st. Yes, sir. Ah, great question. Uh, 750 students are at Out of Door and zero board today. So I neglected to tell you that uh, long before I came here, uh, the school eliminated the boarding program. Um, so that's, that's no longer part of it. If, it. if it were part of it, having worked in a boarding school, I would have no black hair left. Uh, it's a whole, I mean, that's a 24-7 job. It's a great job, but it's, it's very intensive. So we haven't had boarding, school, uh, boarding students in a in a long time. I'll tell you what, one little anecdote to that, um, just again thinking about the lore and the fact that this would have, uh, this would have happened <laughs> literally on, on this property where we find ourselves this morning. So the tradition at Out of Door was if you um, were a boarder, you could bring a pet. So we had goats, we had turkeys, we had snakes, we had chickens, but the most famous pet of all was a pet named King Tut. And so King Tut was a monkey. And King Tut had a cage uh, underneath one of the banyan trees over there. And as the lore, you know, I wasn't around during this period of time, so I don't know that this is true, but it's a great story. Um, the lore was that the students were always trying to open the cage for King Tut. 
And the reason they were trying to open the cage for King Tut is the, the original school bell is still on our campus. And it rings, if you're ever here in the morning, you may hear it, Tom. It rings uh, at the end of recess before the, the school day begins. And it rings at the end of the school day as well. The fifth graders are responsible for that. Um, but the, the story was that the students wanted King Tut to get out because they had taught King Tut to ring the school bell. Not that it dismissed classes, but it was also the fire alarm in those, uh, those days. So just like, you know, some mischievous students, not, nobody in this room, I'm sure, ever thought about pulling a fire drill or something like that to disrupt the academic day. Uh, the students were always trying to get King Tut to do that. How successful they were, uh, we'll probably never know. Yes, sir, I'm sorry about that. You had another question. Yeah, they all live with their families. So um, we don't, you know, we've had some exchange students, but they're usually connected, you know, with another family here. So we don't, um, yeah, we don't have international students that we're, for example, hosting. We have an exchange with a, a school in Beijing. Uh, so we have about, you know, 10 students from China that come. They're, they're, it's a prep school in China, and they are all wanting to matriculate to American colleges and universities. We host them for those two weeks, and they stay in, in uh, homes of Adador families. Um, but the other international families are, are almost exclusively families that have you know, left Europe and come to the U.S. or left South America and uh, have made Sarasota home, um, but their kids were, were born overseas. Any other? Yes, sir. This is great. I love, I love doing this. We may be here a long time, Tom, so you, you cut me off whenever you need to. Yes, sir. Mm-hmm. What a great story. Fantastic. Fantastic. Thank you for, for sharing that. Um, what a great you know, symbol of the partnership between our two, uh, our two organizations. One last question, and then I know I'm getting the hook here. Yeah, OK. Um, we don't have a lot of kids that take the ACT, but uh, it's at about a 30. Um, our SAT average this year is 1320. Um, and our middle 50%, I just did these numbers for the parents. So the middle group in our school, the middle 50%, their range is 1,200 to 1,400. So if you think about that, that's probably the most compelling statistic, which means that the top 25% are all above um, 1,400. And this year, uh, we had the highest number of merit, national merit scholars ever. We had six national merit scholars. So literally in the top 1% of all the students that take the SAT, I'd say that's a pretty disproportionate number when you have a class of 81. So, well, I can uh, tell you, David, I would have never qualified for any of those. So <laughs> uh, uh, um, I didn't blossom until later. But um, one of the stories you did tell me was that uh, when you, you came here, part of your task was to sh close the, the Siesta Key Chapel, right. or Siesta Key uh, campus. Right, yeah, that didn't, that didn't happen. And why didn't that happen? <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so the, the school, um, when I was hired was struggling because they didn't project that they would graduate 12 seniors. They projected they would graduate more like 40 or 50 seniors. So financially the school was in a, a difficult uh, place and they thought that the, the solution to that financial problem um, was to move this campus out to uh, the Lakewood Ranch campus. And so what we did, um, and it was, I, I would say it was an emotional decision. The school was kind of in crisis at the time, and, and this was the plan that they came up with. Um, I'm a data person. I like to make decisions. I like to make decisions from my heart, 
and what I believe is right, but I also like them to be informed by data. And so we did a lot of research, and we researched the demographics uh, of the area, and we found out that a lot of our students were coming from close to the water. Kind of makes sense. And then we actually looked at um, other demographics, like who supports the school beyond tuition? Philanthropy. And we found that some of our uh, best and most supportive families, predictably, arguably, um, were close to the water. You know, Longboat Key, uh, Bird Key, Siesta Key, kind of west of the trail was a big, was a big um, part of the support for the school. And so once we put all that data back in front, of the, the, also the, the property is valuable, you think? Uh, and I got here right in the whole summer house mess. You remember that whole mm -hmm. thing? Oh boy, and I thought, I don't wanna be the guy selling that property after what happened with, with the summer house. But we also found that, that that property is not that valuable because it doesn't have a water view. And I don't believe anyone was gonna let you put a 10 story condo or anything like that right next door. And you guys probably would've had something to say about that too. Uh, so I think they had overestimated the value of the property. So we put all that together, and I, I will give the Board of Trustees great credit, because the same board that voted unanimously to vacate this property uh, a year after I arrived at the retreat, they voted unanimously to reverse course. Um, the other thing that was really important to me was that uh, the his all the history of the school would have been lost. And I actually spent part of my first year trying to figure out how to move that library, the original library, how to put it on a truck and move it to Lakewood Ranch, because I was, I was convinced we're gonna bring at least that with us. But for all, for 90 plus years of kids, you know, walking on these sandy, you know, grounds and walking right through this area to go to the beach and doing all, all those memories would have been destroyed. And uh, I'm a historian by trade. My original academic background is in history. And so yeah. that history was, okay. was very, very to important ask later, uh, to me to, to preserve. I'll leave you, I know, uh, and I'll be around if, afterwards. You know, if you have questions after uh, this worship service, it'd be great. Uh, uh, we, we do have a congregational meeting. It's 11 o'clock already, and I, I know this has been really interesting. So thank you, David. Yeah, thank you, for, thank your, you. For, your, for your attention. Appreciate it. Let's, um, can we sing, um, <clears throat> just, well, open my, that's a three-verse hymn, right, uh, Cynthia? We'll, we'll sing that, but we'll cut the other one in, in half when we get to this. Uh, so let's uh, sing 451. Let's sing all those verses, and then, then we'll have a br uh, prayer and uh, offering, and then and, and I think we'll, right after the offering, we sing the doxology, I think we'll, we'll go to the uh, benediction, so. <clears throat>
may be seated. And let's pray. Oh, good and gracious God, we give thanks for this day and for the rich history of Siesta Key Chapel and the even dip, deeper history of the Out of Door Academy and their, their connection, their relationship. We give thanks that, we, that those histories have been interconnected and we pray that you will help us to understand how we can continue to develop this significant relationship. Today, Lord, our congregation meets to act upon the recommendations of the All Church Nominating Committee to elect and call a pastoral nominating committee. We give thanks for the prayerful work of the nominating committee and we pray for the candidates who will begin the search for the next called installed pastor of Siesta Key Chapel. Almighty Creator who gives us answers before we pray and hears us even while we are yet not yet, even while we are not yet speaking, draw from our hearts the prayers for your people who have heard your promise of life anew and for the world gravely in need of renewal. Lord, we pray for Christians all around the world, especially those who live in places where there is violence that is in openly hostile actions that are taken against them. Help us, Lord, to understand the power of faith that can endure such attacks and give us the strength and wherewithal to support our brothers and sisters in Christ. This morning, Lord, we pray for members of this congregation. We pray for Bernice Arvidson and Sandy Bear and Margot Belaski and Donna Kaler and Bob Lane, for Al Milner and Christine Penksa, for Ted and Ann Reiner for Bernice Weiss, and for Margie, Margie Young. Lord, we know that you place the yoke of ministry upon our shoulders with the understanding that you are with us, right next to us, pulling the load and answering prayers. This morning, we ask these prayers in your name, and even as we say the prayer that you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let's present to God our gifts and our offerings and the commitment of our very selves.
Our Heavenly God, how grateful we are for the commitment of this congregation to the ministries of this church. And we pray, O oh Lord, that these gifts that we offer this day might empower those ministries in the way that will proclaim your gospel in the way that it will change lives forever. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, we'll not sing that final hymn, okay? And uh, I'm going to give the benediction, and David and I are going to walk out, and you'll have an opportunity to meet David over a cup of coffee. Uh, and uh, then grab that cup of coffee if you are a member of the church and come back in uh, for our congregational meeting, okay? So go now into the per world in peace. Reach, grow, and send in the name of Jesus Christ. Strive to learn the language of the heart and may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be yours this day and forevermore. Amen. Amen.